Um, welcome to the Matsu Borough. My name is Ted Eyscheid. I'm a planner for the borough, and we are excited to have the Matsu Basin Salmon Habitat Partnership meeting at one of the partner locations, the Matsu Borough, the Dorothy Swanda Jones Building. So this is a uh, former high school that's been refurbished extensively. Uh, I find it a privilege to work here because I love history and I, I'm also a former school teacher so I like being here. This is our assembly chambers, quite beautiful. And then for your pleasure, we do have the beautiful mountains directly to the east covered in clouds and fog. But we did plan for you to uh, have that nice view. Also, hopefully you saw the brown bear uh, on your way in. Beautiful uh, example of a, a large brown bear. And since this is a Matsu Salmon Habitat Partnership meeting, I would like it to turn the mic over to our coordinator of Matsu Salmon Habitat Par Partnership, Jessica Speed. So testing, testing. So, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's, as Ted said, my name's Jessica Speed. I am coordinator of the Matsu Basin Salmon Habitat Partnership. I'm employed uh, by the Nature Conservancy. And thank you all so much for being here today. This meeting is really in honor of uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Deputy Director Margaret Everson, uh, in honor of her visit to Alaska. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We're so thrilled that you're here, and um, thank you for taking the time to, to visit the Matsu and, and learn about our, our coalition of, of, of diverse partners here in the Matsu working to conserve wild salmon here. So uh, for anyone who's not familiar with uh, the Salmon Habitat Partnership, I think most people are, but for anyone who's not, we're a coalition of, of now 65 diverse organizations and, and individuals that are just working to keep wild abundant salmon here. Um, so uh, as part of the meeting, we will be having a, a round table uh, discussion, a facilitated discussion, and that is really an opportunity to hear from all of you, and you are really what makes this partnership a success uh, and why it matters. So it's really an opportunity for uh, Deputy Director Everson to, to hear about why you think the Matsu matters, why salmon matter here, why habitat matters, and what the role is of this partnership and, and helping it keep it so. Um, we, w as part of the meeting later on, um, we will be taking the director to visit a, a, a fish passage site on Cottonwood Creek. And I know some folks have expressed an interest in joining us. We do have some space uh, in a borough van. So just let myself or Ted Eyshide know if you'd like to, to join us and would like to get a, a ride in a, in a borough van. And we'll try to make that happen. So looking forward to that this afternoon. Thank you so much to the Matsu Borough for so generously providing this amazing venue that as Ted pointed out, it has the million dollar view, which you can't actually really see today, but it really does. Um, and I also wanted to um, point out uh, Mark Weisenhunt and Carol Reese and Ted Eyscheid, who were just incredible planners and just and really made this, this meeting come together so beautifully. So. Thank you as well for that support uh, as well. We are so honored to have uh, Matsu Borough Assembly postpone a meeting so that they could participate in, in this meeting today. So um, thank you so much for, for making that happen and, and showing how much you value fish here in the Matsu. Um, and uh, I think as I may have mentioned, uh, the Salmon Partnership has you know, 65 diverse organizations, and many of you are seated at the, the table today, and many are founding organizations. Uh, because of time constraints, we will be uh, doing our best to, to, to time keep and try to keep us kind of on schedule as best we can. And just a reminder that this is not a, a public meeting, but most certainly the, the public is more than welcome and, and encouraged to attend. 
Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Mayor Halter to uh, share a few welcoming words. Well, first of all, we want to welcome Margaret and, and uh, Greg for uh, coming to the Matsubara. We really appreciate that. We've had opportunity, our delegation, to visit with you folks out in Washington, D.C. many times. And, you know, we just, we're just so pleased about our partnership and what we're able to do with our culverts and all the work and habitat. So thank you for coming. I want you to know I also have a legal degree. It just wasn't from Vermont Law School, and so <laughs> which I'd have loved to went to, to school at Vermont. So, and I just want to mention we got a couple of assembly members here. Uh, Jim Sykes is sitting down there. Wave your hand. And uh, Tam Bovey and my good friend John Wood is back here. He was on our fish commission for years, and the governor, Dunley, we just appointed him to the state of Alaska Fish Board, and we're very, very happy about that. Uh, the Matsu is, is big, obviously. We're the size of West Virginia, the size of Ireland. We've got the Susitna River drainages and all the tributaries, and, and we've been salmon for thousands of years, and so it's very important to us. And we've had a decline over the last couple of decades, you know, several decades, and, and it's accelerated, and so we want to work on all the habitat and all the issues that, uh, to try to change that about, you know, and so, that's, that's, uh, so we're very pleased to, to have you here. And uh, t so you can look at this yourselves and, and, and see what we're up against. Uh, we have a, the Cook Inlet, of course. We're trying to get our fish up through the Cook Inlet back to our drainages. And sometimes that, that gets to be political along with uh, whatever other realities there are with habitat, too. And uh, so, uh, so we're interested in, in working with everybody. And I, I want to introduce our borough manager, John Moosey. Everybody is uh, very familiar with him. He's going to uh, do some presenting. and. Uh, he, uh, he was kind of happy they changed the borough meeting because it's his evaluation. <laughs> 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 he would actually like to have it, you know, delayed longer. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to John. I just want to thank you very much for coming all the way up here to, to see us to, to Alaska. We appreciate that. And uh, thanks, Ted. Um, so as, as the mayor said, we are thrilled to have you. We really value your partnership. But I think today you're going to see um, from top to bottom, from the mayor to the assembly, all the way down to, to my staff and the partnerships that, w that we have has really been very successful. If there's any place else is it that is as successful as us, we like to see them because um, we don't think so. And it is full cooperation. This is one of few issues where everybody agrees on the value of our, of our fish and, and salmon here, and everyone, um, every person looks to make sure that um, we, secure, we secure that and we in, improve that. One of the things I like to kind of point out is a lot of times when it comes to these discussions, it becomes political. We have worked really hard to make sure this is, we get as much scientific data to make decisions based on the science um, in the environment as opposed to who wants what. And I think it's, um, we've making, we made quite a bit of headway. I think there's more to do. And if there's money coming from the state or the federal government, we had asked you to put that in research and understanding what's going on in our environment and what actions we can take to, um, to make positive changes. So thank you again for coming. We have more important people and with, um, you know, So I when I said more important, you thought of George right away. <laughs> so there's we, we everybody here is um, is, is a great partner, and um, we have people on the front lines daily. So I th we'll cut me short here. I don't want to ruin my evaluation if it's if it's still <laughs> going to be positive. Yeah, thank you so much. So why don't we um, just uh, start with. Uh, introductions and I will pass the microphone and we'll just uh, quickly go around the room and just very briefly maybe just say your name uh, affiliation and role if you please and um, we'll just quickly go around and do introductions and there will be as we've mentioned opportunity uh, coming soon to to provide more sort of feedback on your perspective on the partnership Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Colligan. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Fisheries and Ecological Services Group um, here in Anchorage. Uh, Jim Jensen. I'm the O&M Division Manager for the borough. I work for John. I have the last 10 years, I've been able to be in charge of 
doing the projects, doing the fish passage projects, which we I have lost count how many we've done. But it's a I found a, a real honor and a privilege to be able to do these projects because everybody likes them and they always come out really good for some reason. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Dan Ranella with the uh, Anchorage Fisheries Branch and the Anchorage Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. My name is Amanda Holtz. I am with Great Land Trust. We're the local land trust um, in the area. Um, I'm the lands manager and stewardship director. So um, yeah, we do land conservation in the local area. I'm Libby Kugel, also with Great Land Trust. I'm the communications manager. I'm Trent Liebeck. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Anchorage Field Office. I lead the habitat restoration program. So we lead, work a lot with fish passage, work with the borough, work with the partnership. It's an honor to be here today. Hi, I'm Laura Eldred with the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. I work in the Nonpoint Source Water Pollution Prevention and Restoration Program. And uh, very happy to have you here today, and thank you for taking the time to, to meet with us. My name is Jim Sykes. I, assume I represent Assembly District 1 that is basically the Mananusk River that starts here and goes 155 miles to Lake Louise. And um, I sit on the Fish and Wildlife Commission. It's been an honor to be there because there is such incredible knowledge there that has led to the science, support for science with this partnership, and it's wonderful. And one of the things we're still looking at is supplemental mitigation in addition to what the Corps may require, and that's still in the works. I'm Adrian Baer with the Alaska Center as the Matsu organizer, and I also sit on the steering committee for the partnership. You've already heard me speak, but I'm Ted Eyscheid. I'm a planner for the Matsu Borough. And I also staff our Fish and Wildlife Commission, our Historical Preservation Commission. And uh, I would like to just mention a couple things. Uh, the first of all, just kind of some housekeeping things. Uh, areas of egress, if you have to leave here or here, that break room where we have our social also exits to the outside. If you have to use the bathroom, just go through this door, pull a right. Right before you get to the double doors that are closed, go to the left down a the hallway, there's a bathroom. Uh, you notice there's some water at the table, so just make yourself comfortable, and maybe the mountains will show themselves again. I'm Tam Bovey. I represent Assembly District 7. Uh, yeah, I'm part of the partnership, but not really part of this group. I'm Andy Couch. I'm a local fishing guide. I've been guiding here for more than 35 years, guiding for salmon specifically. I'm Eileen Probasco. I'm the Director of Planning and Land Use here at the Borough. John Wood, very interested observer and the newest member of the Board of Fish. <laughs> Jesse Sumner, Matsu Borough Assembly District 6. Good afternoon, I'm Steve Cohn, Alaska State Director for the Nature Conservancy. Hi, I'm Heather Hansen with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a fish passage engineer and I work with Jim and his staff on executing our fish passage projects. Hi, I'm Dave Rutz. Uh, I'm with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I'm the Director of Sport Fish Division. And first of all, I'd like to thank the Matsu for all these nice blue triangles on this map for putting more fish in the rivers for Andy to catch. <laughs> I'm Jillian O'Darty. I'm with Fish and Game, um, Sport Fish. I um, I'm supervise the Research and Restoration Group, and or sorry, Habitat Research and Restoration Group. And um, I've been working with Jim and his crew for I think over 10 years on fish passage projects in the Matsu. Hello, I'm Christy Sincata. I'm the Executive Director of Tionic Tribal Conservation District, and um, our district's on the west side of Cook Inlet. About half of it's in the Matsu Borough and half in the Kenai Peninsula Borough. And I sit on the steering committee for the Matsu Basin Salmon Habitat Partnership, as well as the Kenai Peninsula Fish Habitat Partnership. My name is Larry Engel. I've been involved in Alaska's fishery since before statehood, over 30 years with the Department of Fish and Game three terms on the Alaska Board of Fisheries and been on the Burroughs, Matsu Burroughs Fish and Wildlife Commission since its inception. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Borio. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska in our regional office and I manage our statewide communications and government affairs. It's back to me, hi. <laughs> 
Good afternoon. Uh, Greg Sikanik, Regional Director for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in Alaska. You know, a few weeks ago I asked a few folks in our office whether or not there was an opportunity for us to come up here and kind of take a look at some of the fish passage work and meet with some of the partners. I had no idea. Uh, you turned out in full force. I can't thank you enough. And partnerships have always been sort of the hallmark of my almost 40 years of working, whether it be with the joint ventures or the North American Waterfall Management Plan or pretty much any post or station I've had. And we can't do this work alone. So I, with that, just thank you very much. We appreciate all of the partnership activities. Wow, thank you. What a warm welcome. Um, I, I, I really appreciate this. Uh, you know, Greg, Greg mentioned a couple of things. You know, uh, there's just really no substitute um, for really getting out um, and seeing what you are all working on. Uh, you know, I think Jim said it earlier, and, and I kind of wrote it down because I didn't want to forget it. Somehow, uh, it comes out really good for some reason, uh, the projects that you all are working on here. Um, and I'm really eager to listen and to learn today because I think um, the reason um, it comes out so well when we are working on these projects together is because we're all working on them um, as a team, uh, that we are uh, recognizing that this is one important partnership. As, as I had a chance to have a uh, town hall uh, with our staff here uh, in Alaska today, um, that we always need to remember from the Fish and Wildlife Service that our mission begins uh, working with others. Um, working with others uh, to accomplish our goals. And, and, and I think um, as I, I read through the information that's been provided, uh, the work that you are all doing here uh, in the MAPSU partnership um, um, really embodies um, what that shared mission is. And I'm so excited uh, that you are all able to come together today, uh, move meetings around and move mountains in some cases, uh, uh, to come here today uh, and help me understand this better um, and again, uh, I think you'd mentioned it earlier. Um, this is this is this is perhaps one of the places across the country um, that we do this better than anywhere else uh, as a partnership. So I'm really excited uh, to hear from all of you today, um, and thank you so much for including me today. And thank you, uh, Jessica, and and the mayor, <laughs> um, uh, for again your kind welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, being able to all come together today. And uh, thanks for all the folks uh, uh, who are members of the community as well. Thank you. We have a few other folks to introduce themselves. Stand up so everybody can see me. I'm usually not too hard to miss. My name's Howard Delo. I'm vice chair of the uh, Matsu Borough Fish and Wildlife Commission, retired fish and game, former member of the Board of Fish, and I just came to kind of listen and hear what was going on. Thank you. My name is Brad Swartz. I work in the Capital Projects Department, and once in a while we get to work with Jim on, a, on managing a fish passage project. Thank you. Did we get everybody? I think so. Carol? Carol Reese, planner, Matsu Burrow. Yeah, organizer extraordinaire. There we go. Yes, yeah, so. It really is a, a privilege and an honor to yeah, to be involved with this partnership and, and, and just see people showing up and all the knowledge here. So on the agenda, we have a little bit of, next is a little bit of background uh, on the partnership. And really, all, you know, all that knowledge is really in this room. Um, and that's one of the benefits of, of being the coordinator and being a part of this partnership is someone asks you a question, you can point to the expert and they're, they're all here. It's quite amazing and all clearly so invested. So um, there are a few places really in the world where salmon are still running up rivers and feeding communities and the Matsu is one of them. And salmon are clearly an essential part of people's lives here, whether you're a commercial fisherman, guide sport fishing, uh, whether you're someone who takes your family out and you fish on the weekends and that's how you connect 
or you're out on the land and, and collecting food for the winter. Um, salmon are essential to the economy, ecology, and, and culture of this place. And like the mayor said, the Matsu was vast, and maybe you got a sense when you drove in how big it is, even just a, just a taste of it. And it's biologically rich. You know, five species of Pacific salmon returning to spawn here. Some juveniles, some species have juveniles that are staying here for years, rearing in Matsu's fresh waters. There's also uh, a rapidly growing human population here. So in other parts of the world, when there have been increases in human population and wild salmon, the, the standards that you see wild salmon populations decline as human populations go up. And here, and with this partnership, we have a vision where we think we can get it right the first time, and that there's a vision where we see that we have thriving salmon and healthy communities and economies in, in this place. And that's what we work towards. So the partnership formed in 2005 to address increasing impacts from, from human use and development in the Matsu. And it went from uh, one of four pilot fish habitat partnerships across the country to one of 21 today. We went from four uh, founding organizations to now 65. Uh, all of those founding organizations happen to be in this room today, and they are the Matsu Borough, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, the Nature Conservancy, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. That's pretty impressive. That's nearly 15 years of sustained investment. Uh, so the partnership's efforts are guided by a strategic plan, and that plan works in, in four key ways and that's to improve our, our body of knowledge around salmon and, and their habitat, to restore degraded habitats, and to conserve uh, um, uh, unimpacted, and, uh, yeah, unimpacted habitats. And it's also to bring people together. I think that's one of the things that par the partnership does really well, is provide a forum for information sharing, um, and, and collaboration, and sometimes more challenging discussion. Uh, so those are some of the, 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 the services that the, the partnership provides and some of our goals. Uh, we've provided over $3 million for 91 salmon habitat projects in the Matsu since 2006 through National Fish Habitat Partnership funds, uh, and that's with you know, millions more in, in, in match. Uh, and leverage. Um, we've, uh, for a few highlights, we've identified uh, 28,000 additional stream miles. We've drastically increased our knowledge of juvenile salmon distribution and abundance. Um, fish passage has been restored in over 100 sites, and fish-friendly design standards on borough roads are helping to prevent the creation of new barriers. Partners have been nationally recognized for their outreach fish passage and science accomplishments. Uh, the fish, the Matsu Borough received an award in 2014 for fish passage. Um, in November, we'll host our 12th annual um, Matsu Salmon Science and Conservation Symposium. You're all welcome, November 14th and 15th. Hope to see you there. And in late August, we have a, an annual, our fifth annual summer site tour. So those are just a, a few highlights um, of the partnership. You're certainly going to hear uh, and learn more about uh, some of the partnership accomplishments on the site visit. You'll get a better sense and hear from different partners. Uh, and you'll also hear a variety of perspectives as we move through our agenda today. So um, did you have any other comments or questions at this point, or is there anything that uh, of particular interest that we can help um, provide you with more sort of information about at this point and as we move into the agenda and more open discussion.
So I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to Ted Eyscheid, who's going to tell you, give you a little bit of background on a video we're going to show. Yeah, it's my pleasure to share a, a short video that Stefan Hinman developed on our Fish Passage program. And the really nice thing about the video is if a picture says a thousand words, a video probably says more. So this is a short YouTube video uh, that was developed that essentially shows a time lapse uh, uh, photography of a, a fish passage culvert being put in. And many of the people at the table here will be interviewed. There's a little bit of humor. And uh, you should be able to see that on any of the screams. Stefan, did you have anything you want to say? Okay, let's roll. And if you'd humor me, the uh, creator of that video, of course, it showed a lot of hard work, was <coughs> Stefan Hinman. And my goal is to embarrass him a little bit with gratitude. So would you join me in giving Stefan a round of applause for that excellent work? <laughs> and I think what that video really illustrates is, you know, partnership is kind of an abstract term. But, you know, 65 partners, what does that mean? Well, I mean 65 organizations, but within each organization, there's a lot of people involved. So here in the Matsu Borough, we have a number of people involved, and, you know, Stefan is part of that team. So a lot of good work happens on the behalf of fish and fish habitat. So thank you, Stefan, for that. And I would like to turn the mic over to uh, one of our other partners to lead kind of a facilitated 
uh, roundtable discussion, and that would be Christy Sincata. Christy is the Executive Director of the Tionic uh, Tribal Conservation District, one of our partners, and she's going to have uh, engage you with conversation that you're going to give back to her, back and forth, for the next 35 minutes or so. Are we able to get that? Heads up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, uh, as Ted said, today we're going to be having a conversation, and uh, I have a few uh, questions to kind of guide our discussion as we go through today. Um, and since we have so many great partners represented here, I really encourage you to share all of your unique perspectives. Um, we're going to, instead of hand raising, we're going to try something a little bit different. So, um, to uh, to indicate that you'd like to speak, I'm going to ask that you turn your nameplate vertical like this. Um, that will kind of cue you up to be in the line to, to speak. And then once I come and give you the microphone, you can just go ahead and normalize it again. Um, since we have a large group and a limited amount of time, um, I'll be watching the clock, or I'll be asking Ted to watch the clock. And um, I might step in to move us along um, if I need to. Uh, Margaret, we really want to make sure that you have a chance to engage with this group, so you know, please do jump in if you have questions or comments and you don't even have to turn your nameplate at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. But you do have a, a microphone there, and I think that just needs to be turned on. Um, when it, yeah. Um, let's see. So as Margaret is a visitor to Alaska, um, I want to start us off with a focus on why salmon um, and their habitat are so special to people in this part of the world. Um, so my first question uh, to get us going is, why and how are salmon, and really especially their habitat, so important in the Matsu and Alaska? And I want to encourage you to um, share why this topic is personally important to you and, and share any stories that you might have. So I was in a small Alaska community recently, and they had a big chalkboard on a sidewalk on the side of a building, and people could walk by and write on it. But at the top, it said, I love salmon because, and people could put in why they love salmon. So I wrote down some of the, the interesting things that people put. One was, it makes me money. Another one was, um, they make my tummy happy. <laughs> uh, one was, some ugly things are good for you. Someone said they swim upstream, and someone wrote, it reminds me of home. And so it just made me think, salmon provide that sense of place, that sense of community. They p have health benefits, they have economic benefits. So all these are very important, especially here in the Matsu for all of us. Thank you, Laura. Um, also, I want to make sure to include um, the other folks in the room as well, not just at the table, so please do, um, you don't have a nameplate, so you'll have to raise your hand. <laughs> Salmon are the food base for a lot of our wildlife resources. Thanks. I just want to say really quick, we have a, about a half a million uh, sport fishermen in this state that utilize these resources. And the key to the pristineness of the state waters up there is our habitat protection. And we do a great job at that, you know, and we have been doing a great job at that. However, you know, um, with heavy development in the Matsu area, you know, uh, you know, in some of the year, early years, you know, these small streams didn't seem that much of an important thing. And uh, later on, you know, as uh, some of our fish stocks started to decline, you know, we started to look around for things, and that's what this big partnership thing did. And uh, I mean, it, it is such a great collaborative effort to see all us folks get together and restore habitat, even in a state where you'd think you wouldn't need that to be done, you know? So my kudos, you guys are awesome. Before we go too far, uh, we've referred to this culvert thing already and uh, on the video about culverts. And, uh, 
other descriptive things. The culverts here were uh, measured by the Department of Fish and Game for their uh, ability to pass fish years ago, as they were throughout a good part of Alaska. Important thing I want everybody to recognize here is that they were no more deficient here in this borough than elsewhere, Kenai Peninsula, Copper River. But the program to correct these deficient culverts have been very, very aggressive here, far more so than most other places in the state. And I think it's an important thing to recognize as you go out and visit some of these sites. And why were the culverts so deficient? Back in territorial days, when I first came to Alaska, there was essentially no people just dug a hole, rolled the culvert in, and, and now we're facing all these years later trying to correct them. But it's been a very aggressive program here, but the problem is no greater here than elsewhere in the state. Um, so I'm actually a fish passage improvement coordinator as well and led the assessment. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk about. Um, I think one of the strengths of the Matt Matsu partnership, and it's not someone who's at the table, is the landowners and the residents of the valley. And so we've done assessment work all over the state. I've had numerous field crews for about eight years out doing assessment work. And we're out on the roads in all the neighborhoods in our survey gear surveying. And people always come out and they say, what are you doing? And we're like, we're surveying the road. And they're like, good, this is a terrible road. And then we say, no, no, we're surveying it for fish. And they're like, oh, for fish. And the next thing you know, I mean, they're like, so I've lived here for this long. And they're showing you pictures of the fish they caught in the stream. And they're telling you when they put this culvert in, it caused a problem. Or when they replaced this culvert, it fixed a problem. We've had people bring us laminate and cookies. And I know they know who we are because so I have celiac and honey gluten. and couple times I've showed up on a site visit and someone has had gluten-free snacks ready for me. So they knew, <laughs> they, they've all been talking to each other. And it's really interesting. We also get, um, I would say six or seven times a year, a landowner calls us up and asks us to come and assess a culvert on private land because they're interested in finding out if it will replace fish. So I think from my perspective, one of the real strengths of this partnership is just the incredibly broad-based public support. And you know, those folks aren't here today. So I just wanted to speak for them a little bit. you. I'd just like to say that um, I think salmon are extraordinarily important out here. When I was a kid growing up, uh, my family was dirt poor. We lived out in Pittman without running water. Alaska's going through a depression and salmon's basically how we survived. Um, rather than subsisting off the government, we subsisted off of salmon. So I would hate to see that opportunity to go away for other people. Sorry, I forgot the protocol. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about fish passage. I'm going to talk about interrupting their passage. I'm a personal use dip netter. And uh, I usually fish at Kasilov, but one of my personal commitments to try and make sure that we keep habitat and uh, support for our fish being restored and uh, vital is I would rather do my personal use dip netting here. Now, we do have a, an occasional opening uh, at Fish Creek down KGB, but usually when the opening happens, if you're not there in an hour, uh, with your canoe and your chest waders and your float or whatever, it's it's uh, kind of difficult. The the fish do run after that, but uh, my hope is is that we can um, make it possible to restore our runs so that people, whether they catch it uh, uh, with a rod and reel or, or a, a dip net, can uh, can rely on it as a resource as well as restore the very very vital tourism economy that used to be here 20 years ago. It was it was enormous and it's a shadow of its former self today. But we're working on it. A uh, number of years ago, we did a uh, project or an initiative to um, called our Kingmakers, and we um, identified a number of people around the Matsu or people or businesses and um, awarded them a Kingmaker Award, which was basically just any type of thing that they had done to um, help 
improve salmon habitat or protect salmon habitat. And the local paper did a, um, I forget how many weeks it was, but like six week series highlighting each of those people. And it was really neat to kind of hear the different stories. And it was a big array of, you know, someone's private land um, just protecting the stream bank that they have going through their land to people doing really big conservation projects and donating hundreds of acres. And so that was a really neat project to um, just show the different types of conservation that people can do. It doesn't have to be really big. It can be really small and still be important. I, I just want to say I'm, I'm extremely worried about the salmon situation in the Matsu borough because I, for years, I think it was 32 years, I lived up off of Moose Creek, which is way up northern. If you look at your map by Petersville Road, I was on a tributary. Uh, and Moose Creek used to get the king salmon, the red salmon, the pink, silvers, every species. And over a 30-year period, it declined down to a very small amount of any species coming all the way up to that point. Now I live on Nancy Creek, which is in Willow, coming off of Nancy Lake. Nancy Lake used to get red salmon by the the tons and the silvers used to come through and then spawn up Nancy Creek and Lily Creek and all those. And I, I think for 10 years I have not seen a silver coming up Nancy Creek. And uh, so we have some things that we have to keep being vigilant, I guess. And I was very pleased about what Mr. Sumner said down there because that's how I existed for many years in Moose Creek was subs uh, you know, subsistence off of salmon. And uh, I did have sled dogs, but we never used salmon for sled dogs except if it was commercially purchased. Uh, but I, I know that value for a lot of people, especially District 7 where Miss Bovey is, and you see the map of the Matsu Borough back there, that whole Susitna drainage and all those streams are, are, are suffering. Of course, we've got a lot of things. We've got pike. We had northern pike kind of move in on us too, so we didn't have to be vigilant on those. And in Moose Creek, I know the, the beavers started damming Moose Creek up there just like as you could take them out and uh, my neighbor was pretty good with dynamite I don't know if that was legal or not but, but <laughs> I won't use his name <laughs> but <laughs> beavers could rebuild overnight is what I'm trying to say and so I, I'm just really worried about our situation with salmon not only getting them back up here through the cook inlet but uh, the restoration process so we have a we have a lot of work cut out for us I just want to say one thing really quick. Uh, we've been in a statewide downturn uh, for Ch Chinook salmon production since 2007. In this, it's statewide, so it's a really big issue. And uh, as everybody knows that sitting around this table, king salmon was our bread and butter. When the king salmon production went down, we watched license sales go down, and you know we have to match the money that this generous lady over here gives us through our Dingle Johnson funds. And <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to mention this year, we're starting to see a little bit of brightness on the horizon. So what, we did, what we're looking at this year in almost every one of our, our monitored fisheries, we're seeing huge runs of one ocean jacks. Haven't seen that in 20 years. And uh, I talked to our chief uh, Chinook salmon biologist down in Juneau, and uh, he's a little cautiously optimistic, but he said the last time that happened, the next year we saw a huge production in uh, two ocean fish, and then it followed, and, and those were the big numbers we started putting up. And I don't know if some of you can probably remember this, but years ago we actually put 59,000 Chinook salmon through the Deshka weir. You know, I mean, that was a huge number. And so the production that we're losing from Chinook salmon is in the marine environment. And it was within their first year in the marine environment. So seeing that type of thing this year, it, it kind of makes you just smile a little bit, you know, because who knows what could happen from here. 
but at least it's a good spot in the horizon. And so and we've been seeing some really good numbers of sockeyes come back, early run sockeyes. And so that's another good, uh, a good sign on the horizon. So, you know, we've already been increasing bag limits. We've been exceeding escapement gold down in the Kenai and the Russian River. And so keep in mind, these things do come back. When I got up here in 1973, and Larry can tell you that, there wasn't a king salmon fishery open in this whole area. I mean, if we wanted to catch king salmon, we had to go up to the Gulcana River to do it. And so there is uphills and downhills. So you, we just got to be around long enough to remember those things. And we'll take one more and I'll move us on. The importance of salmon. I think it's very clear to me that the importance of salmon to Alaskans is, is great. It was one of the big incentives for statehood to have your own control, local control over the management of this important resource. And the state set up a system of regulatory that allowed the local people to have uh, a role in this because each of the community, such as this community here uh, and other small communities throughout the state have their advisory committees that are sponsored by the state to advise the regulatory bodies such as the Board of Fish or Board of Game what their local interests were. And so, and then we've seen things like the, the closure of the 200 mile limit off of our coast. That was a, our local legislator, not our, our senator, was a big, uh, Senator Stevens, a big uh, incentive for that sort of stuff because of the importance of salmon and other and these resources to uh, all of us. And that and local involvement has been continued and we've seen it such as this Natsu salmon habitat. It's very clear that without the local involvement, uh, you wouldn't have that importance or the, the drive to protect the salmon and their, their habitat. And here in this borough, we have, which I'm a member of, I indicated earlier, Matsu Fish and Wildlife Commission, sponsored by the borough, to advise, represent the borough and local people, get local input on how we should be managing this important resource and the habitat that supports it. So I think there's probably no other state uh, that has any stronger local involvement or uh, from the local folks to a major important uh, industry such as the, the salmon is to both to sport commercial and subsistence uses. So. Okay, um, my next question is, how does the partnership reflect a successful collaboration of diverse partners for fish habitat uh, conservation? And yeah, please share examples from your organizations. Uh, the partnership for me and what I do here at the borough and O and M is uh, the science that Jillian and Heather and everybody gathers and being able to identify the areas and the different fisheries. And lately, it's mostly been rearing habitat, I believe, we've really been going after and opening up more miles and miles of the habitat. And the borough, with the way the borough is set up with our finance department and our purchasing department, we're able to accept the monies from Fish and Game and match it with borough funds. And I've never had any issues with the assembly as far as it says fish passage, it goes right on through, which I really like. We have a couple, we have a really big project going on this summer. We're actually dealing with a road that DNR has determined it was a dam. And so now I'm an operator of a dam. I didn't realize, but, and so it's, it's been one of the more trickier ones that we've had to do. Heather and Jillian can maybe speak up a little bit about this. But we're moving forward. We'll be turning dirt here next, next couple of weeks. And we have a smaller one on Shaman that I believe just got awarded. So we'll be doing two this year. We've been averaging around three to four, to, I mean, I think around four passages a year we've been getting done all, all over the place. I, <coughs> my, part, my part of the partnership is making the contracts come together and getting them built. I rely on every, you know, the different agencies and their science and their approach, so we're just not willy-nilly going out there and replacing culverts. There is a strategic plan behind this. We talk about it. We look ahead, years ahead in the future. In, you know, we got to line funds up, it, and it takes a little while. And so as a partnership, this all comes together, and we have the flexibility to if something out of sight, be it 
you know, property right away or utility conflicts, we can shift and be able, to be able to move to where we are every year being able to get, you know, an average of four of these projects done. And so and, and it, it takes a team effort. There's no way I could do this by myself as I, I don't have the staff and I rely on everybody to have their input on it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd completely agree with you that fish passage projects are like the perfect example of partners coming together to get something great done on the ground. <laughs> yeah, um, Gemma, the answer to this question I was thinking really is about the prioritization process. You know, every one of these projects costs three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Um, and we got to be making good decisions. And in order to make those decisions, we need good science and good data. We need to know the stream miles, what what the upstream habitat is, well, what that kind of habitat the juvenile fish prefer, because those are the ones we're really targeting. And fish and game, uh, fish and wildlife, uh, the borough, and a lot of the other partners that have done different science projects that have been funded by this NIFAP um, have been really valuable in helping us make those decisions. So I really appreciate um, that data. Thank you. Uh, just going back on some of my past history, uh, when I first took a look at the fisheries here, I was with the legislative staff with the, uh, the senator who is now your governor, and the thing that came blaring out at us was the lack of real scientific data with which to even start managing the fisheries. So we were successful in getting a whole pile of money sent down to the local bodies here to spend on nothing but research. And the reason I bring that on up is we have a representative from Washington here, and the biggest help that we could use is funding science based projects uh, and from a personal perspective and only personal I'd much rather see money go towards that than disaster declaration funds going to individual fishermen etc when they have a poor season uh, if we're looking to the fish future I think science is, is the answer second I don't know enough about your your organization to comment directly to your question but I can tell you to what use your information is given at the Board of Fish uh, hearings that I was involved in, there was a lot of clamor about both pike and these culverts. The only problem with that argument, there are no culverts on the west side, okay, uh, to speak of, you may have one or two. So if they would quit raising boogeymen and start dealing with directly with the real issues of fish passage, et cetera, we'd be much better off. We can then take these arguments and say, put them to the side, folks. That's not the problem. Let's see what the real problem is. Why does Shell Lake go from the third most producing sockeye to 15 fish returning this year? And that's where we need the science dollars, and it's going to be most helpful. So to that extent, one of your partners last week funded a tour of the entire Susitna Basin. If there's any way you can do that with the representatives from Washington, D.C., it would be most helpful. We had on board that flight and on the river boats four of the seven Board of Fish members and the commissioner and his assistant. The commissioner came off the plane in Talkeetan and says, now I can actually see for myself how I could lose 100,000 king settlement and not even know it. So keep up the good work. It's not just the culverts, and I hope that some of the partners involved deal with issues beyond culverts. Thank you. Take up too much time. I just wanted to speak a little bit to the nuts and bolts of when we say all the partners are working together for the prioritization and and we're expanding this process now out to stream bank work, et cetera. But essentially everyone says well fish and game did the assessment work. And that's true. We did go out and do the measuring and such, but um we have a large database and we do our prioritizations. We actually have four active ones in the MATSU right now. The first thing we're doing is we're looking at our assessment work to determine if it's a barrier. Then we're looking at the stream miles, and we are using USGS data, borough data. Um, the Nature Conservancy was involved. I mean, there were a lot of people involved in the NHD upgrade. I'm not even going to try to list them all. So that's a huge part of our data. We're looking at bathymetry data for the lakes, a lot of which has been collected by um, various organizations over the years. Then we basically are looking at road ownership maps, which we also get from the borough or DOT, or the 
railroad, we sit down with the group we're doing the prioritization with and we have a rough cut. And at that point, we start turning to our more detailed localized data sources. We have a temperature, water temperature data set that's been funded by the partnership. We have flow information. We have um, information from Fish and Game on stocking and fishery use and whether it's a run of concern or not. We have information from Fish and Wildlife Service. They've done pretty extensive habitat surveys and habitat utilization. Dan's, I may be characterizing this slightly wrong, but um, habitat utilization, and we can use that information. There's also some habitat modeling that's been done in the borough that was partially funded through the partnership that um, we can use in some areas and not others. So the prioritization, kind of the, the way it's working essentially is we start out, you know, very broad and we work our way down. And as we work our way down, we just keep going back to these partners over and over and saying, do you have information for these sites? And we call Jessica and say, what do you have for these sites? And she's like, ah. But um, we, that's essentially what we're doing. And I think it allows us to, we try to sort of pick about 10 or 20 sites at a time to prioritize, I think is sort of, you know, five years of work. And it's worked so well, um, and we really don't have a lot of controversy over the sites that we pick, so we're actually now turning around and applying that same method to our stream bank restoration program, starting with state lands. We've sort of sat down and started prioritizing those. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how the, the feedback loop. We've also um, done some case studies, monitoring fish passing through these culverts before and after, and then we have just received funding, and this is from Fish and Wildlife Service to Fish and Game, to do a retrospective look at about, um, we've I think 114 sites in the pool. We're gonna go out next summer, we're gonna select a subset of sites and we're gonna assess them for stability over time and effectiveness monitoring. So this will be going all the way back about 15 years. And I feel like that's really the closing the loop on our science program. Um, and obviously the results of that will feed back into the design process and, and we'll be working with Heather and the other engineers designing these studies so that they get what they need out of it as well. So that's kind of, I guess, our process in a way, and I feel like it's very applicable to other concerns that we have in the borough too. We've talked a lot about fish passage today because that's kind of who's here, but um, there's certainly other other programs like in-stream flow and habitat. <laughs> we could wanted to make that a little more clear what the partners did. We'll take one more and then we'll go on to the next question. Yeah, thanks Christy. Yeah, uh, moving a little bit beyond uh, fish passage, there's a somewhat large collaborative effort now among uh, many of the partners in this organization to understand and um, sort of take the long view on stream temperature and um, some work spearheaded by Sue Mauger at Cook Inlet Keeper, one of the partners here. Um, she monitored stream temperature in 50 salmon streams around Cook Inlet Basin for multiple years. And um, in looking at that data, we realized that some of the more lowland streams, particularly s s tributaries to the Susitna drainage, are already reaching temperatures that are widely considered to be stressful for salmon. We've done some uh, projecting into the future using some models that we developed as part of that work, and we're seeing that those streams are warming very rapidly. And so now we're, um, with partnership funds and a lot of partnership participation, we are um, embarking on some sort of um, very intensive temperature monitoring networks where we can understand um, where exactly water temperatures are going to remain suitable for salmon into the future and where we need to be concerned. And then, you know, the real tricky part then is, you know, how do we formulate conservation actions to maintain connectivity of those thermally suitable habitats and maintain the sort of mechanisms that keep those habitats cool, like groundwater flow paths, riparian shading that sort of thing. So we are very focused on stream temperature in the partnership. It's one of our sort of ob objectives in the strategic plan. And um, it's definitely something we're, yeah, working on. I was just going to add kind of relatedly to the fish passage prioritizations um, at GLT. We've done some prioritizations with help from the partnership on um, land parcels along salmon streams along the priority water bodies in the maps. And I think Amanda might talk about this a little, so feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. But um, that those prioritizations have helped us be strategic in choosing which um, land conservation projects we've done. Um, we've done mailings with funding from the Fish Habitat Partnership to landowners um, who rank high in those prioritizations. And those have, I think we did a big mailing maybe 
five, seven years ago, and we still get people contacting us from that mailing. Um, and then we've also been able to create this uh, stream pack, uh, this um, living next to a salmon stream brochure, which we hand out, and we uh, at one point mailed to, I think, a thousand landowners in the Matsu who might not have ranked high in the prioritization, but um, lived next to a salmon stream, and again, showing the conservation, the range of conservation options that um, are available to people. Question. Um, how does the partnerships approach demonstrate conservation without controversy, and how has that been important in our success? Thanks. Um, I, d I wanted to follow up a little bit on something that Jim mentioned um, on replacing fish um, culverts that were that were inadequate for the um, for the passage of salmon, um, and and then his little follow up comment was, and we've taken steps to ensure that you know future construction in these in these important streams is done appropriately. So that's part of what our department does in our um, construction manual. Um, we. <laughs> It's a, it's amazing. It's it's always a challenging thing to get new regulations in place um, for for any particular thing. But when it came th when it came through for the suggestion that we should improve our construction manual to provide for that more rigorous review and, and higher standards for construction uh, of roads across uh, anadromous streams, it went through like that. I was just surprised. I think we all sat out there and went, "Wow, that was amazing." So. That, that was kind of a cool success, and I think part of it was uh, just the involvement and the education that this uh, group provides. So. So Eileen just brought up a, a good word for our, our uh, partnership here is education. And you've heard another couple words throughout this discussion, science and data. And so this partnership is all about education, science, and data, and sharing that information with whoever wants it or needs it. <laughs> and, um, and so th there's a science and data committee, and so that committee is, is really, I think, a key piece to this partnership to keep it neutral so we're not political. We don't advocate for for certain things we stay neutral and we base our decisions and our projects on the science and I think think that it, um, helps provide the community um, that trust that they can trust the information that we have because we're not we're not choosing sides or anything it's just straight down the middle science and data Anybody? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I need to think of a real controversial question. That's it. I can raise a little controversy. Um, <laughs> um, in order to have a healthy salmon population, you very obviously need very healthy salmon habitat. And this partnership does a, a wonderful job at doing that. But you also have to have enough fish come back to be able to utilize that habitat if you want to maintain strong runs of fish. And the way the state manages their fisheries, a very open process, unfortunately it's highly political. It wasn't supposed to be, but it is. And uh, a lot of the organizations involved in this partnership cannot advocate, as Laura said, for reasons of, of the mission statements of the group or other limitations. They can't get out and advocate in front of the regulatory bodies or even the managers themselves to do this or do that regarding interception of fisheries and everything else. Right now, uh, we are at the end of the bottleneck of Cook Inlet. Everybody else gets a shot at the fish before we do. In years of high abundance, it's not necessarily a problem. In years of low abundance, it can have a real impact depending on how the fishery is managed. And it's only recently come to light, well, 
specifically recently in that they've got hard data to support it now because of the science that John was talking about. Our geneticists have identified that there's interception of Cook Inlet salmon all through the Gulf Coast, actually, almost, down in the Kodiak area and everything else. We're losing significant numbers of fish to the fisheries down there. And, I mean, it's been that way forever, and we've survived. But we do need to kind of keep an eye on things. As Dave mentioned, we've been in a downturn on king numbers. That's more environmental, they think, than anything else, although the uh, a lot of the troll fisheries for pollock at one point were having a major impact. We're currently looking now uh, the, uh, let's make sure I get it right, I think it's the National Marine Fisheries uh, is, is currently working on fisheries management plans in Cook Inlet that could run opposite of how the state looks at things. We don't know. We don't know how that's going to go. So the, the whole future of, of the fisheries is a little bit uncertain, and I realize that groups can't advocate uh, generally, and we're not asking you to as a group, but if you have some personal thoughts, it doesn't hurt to attend a Board of Fish meeting, um, hear what's going on, if you have data and science that would contribute to the discussion then you might want to uh, provide that to this regulatory body also. And I've already gotten the sign to sit down and shut up, so I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> oh. yeah, no. <laughs> anyway, conservation without conflict, I'm not real familiar with that because <laughs> it seems like every time I try to be conservative on something, there's a lot of conflict. So it's a little different when you're, you're screwing down fisheries a little bit, reducing harvest, reducing effort, reducing fishing time, and that type of thing. There's always conflict. But if I got a, a couple of quick seconds, I want to show at least one good success story. You know the Big Lake story? I see a lot of pyramids around Big Lake, okay? We, we also did a restructuring of the outlet on Big Lake to allow fish passage in that system. And Howard, you'll probably remember this at a board meeting about, what, 12 years ago? We had some of our staff say to the board that we do not want to manage our commercial fisheries to Big Lake anymore because Big Lake is dead. It is absolutely dead. There's hardly any fish returning. The pike killed everything, the lack of culverts, that type of thing. Well, today, Big Lake is doing better than ever. The sockeye returns to that system have uh, exceeded escapement goals in the last five or six years, so that is one plus, and you guys all did stuff to help that, so kudos. Thank you, and thank you everybody for your input and insight during our conversation. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Ted Eichheit, uh to wrap things up. Thank you, Christy. So my job is to just kind of summarize what I heard at least and you know talk about the future, I guess. And uh, Deputy Director, I'm going to ask you to share some takeaways, so just kind of a, a warning that you get to follow me. But uh, a couple of things I, I, I hear, and I'm fairly new to Alaska. I've been here full time for three years. But what amazes me is how people love salmon. And all the people around this table and others not here, they love salmon as well. And all of us work together, uh, many of us through the Salmon Habitat Partnership, to create a lot of good and to maintain a lot of good. You know, I hear about salmon as being healthy, as being important for people as a food source. Uh, I would argue also as a spiritual source. I don't know if you've gotten that sense yet, but salmon are sacred here. I've heard that funding science and collaborating, being data-driven, and now using education, which is close to my heart as a, a former educator, to share information and bring people together really matters. And the Salmon Habitat Partnership is the infrastructure for that locally. And I, I guess, you know, when we talk about infrastructure is supposed to give some good, I see and hear a lot of good here in the Matsu borough 
uh, through my, my work with the Salmon Habitat Partnership. And I guess, finally, you know, conservation without controversy. So uh, in the borough, we have controversy. And, and I've worked on some of those controversial issues. And it's tough. It's tough. But what's really neat about salmon is there's not much controversy. Yeah, there's parts that are controversial. But when people are having dinner over a piece of salmon or talking about a fishing story or talking about when their kids were watching spawning salmon and the excitement of that, what we have here and what the Salmon Habitat Partnership has facilitated is a lot of people coming together, putting skin in the game financially and making good things happen. I mean, it's, it's a great thing. So as we go forward, you know, some of the challenges that the Salmon Habitat Partnership, as I see it, will have to face is, if I can bring my tripod over here. You know, a tripod is stable because it has three legs. One of those legs is the partners. So we need the support of the partners. We have 65 now. Every one of them is important. Another leg, and I heard this a lot, is science. The Salmon Habitat Partnership relies on good science. Funding science matters. And then I think, you know, getting back to that funding thing, uh, you know, that matters too. And we know that in this world we live in, there's a lot of uh, competition for those funds. And I would like to see the Salmon Habitat Partnership continue because they, they produce a lot of bang for the buck. They really do. And it really affects people's lives up here in Alaska, not just the people who live here, but the 1.8 million, um, that might be $1.8 billion that brings in, but there's a lot of people that come up here to see the fish. And we're happy that you came up here. So I'm gonna put my tripod away, at least safely, I hope, and gonna give the deputy director a chance to respond, but uh, have a small gift. Since the Salmon Habitat Partnership is like 65 groups working together, I've got a fish necklace. Necklaces, there's two there. You can count and see if there's 65 between the two of them. But yeah, but that's that's for you, and um, I'll let you make some comments. Is it on then? Is it on now? Great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, uh, I, uh, let me make one observation uh, on my my own salmon story uh, here, very very briefly. Um, uh, so I have um, personally. Um, no social media presence. I've never been on Facebook. I've never been um, on, uh, um, oh goodness, all the other things, the Twitter and the Instagram or any of that. Um, at one point, somebody asked me to set up a LinkedIn page, uh, which I do not monitor. Um, I have one picture um, on my entire realm of social media, and that's me holding a salmon. Um, it's something uh, that's uh, uh, that was a special day for me. It's something that I enjoy personally and, and thought I would uh, share that today as I, as I move forward in thanking all of you uh, for sharing what were some very personal stories um, as, as we walked around the tables. And I think I heard a lot about um, you as individuals, you as part of your communities, uh, even more so uh, than you as members of your organization. I thought that that was really special. Uh, one of the notes that I took down uh, was connection to place as we talk about what salmon means. Uh, you described uh, the Matsu as being the size of West Virginia. I can relate to that because I am from West Virginia. Um, and as somebody who comes from a place that shares very similar values, I think, to Alaska, the importance of the landscape, um, the importance of uh, what uh, subsistence fishing means, uh, subsistence harvest means uh, to many of the people from my state, um, I understand uh, some of the personal stories you all told today. Uh, and I can certainly appreciate those. Uh, so I wanted to first thank you all uh, for sharing that uh, with me today and also uh, really recognizing that, that connection to place, which I think was the foundation for a lot of the discussion and for the formation uh, of this partnership. Uh, a couple of themes that really um, spoke to me today as we talked uh, 
um, about all of this being driven by science and the importance that we all place um, on good science um, about <laughs> continuing that science uh, as we make uh, all of these management decisions. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, is driven by science. We are a science-driven agency. Um, and I know that many of you, the state fish and wildlife partners, uh, the borough, and many of our NGO partners who are sitting around today all share that same um, objective. Uh, and I certainly appreciated hearing about that today. Um, we are also doing a lot of work, um, which I think is important, um, here on metrics and measuring. Um, so we see the things that are working. You know, Larry touched on, uh, which I think was some pretty important perspective, um, of historical perspective, seeing it um, the way that it has been over the decades, uh, being able to draw uh, from that traditional knowledge and from that, that sense uh, as is so important uh, across Alaska and many of its communities. And so um, hearing how there are metrics that have been put in place along the way to measure successes where it's working and where it doesn't because oftentimes it is just as important to learn from where we have failed uh, than where we have succeeded. And so um, I appreciated that as well. Also the continuing interest um, in communications uh, and education. You know, people really want to protect uh, what they value and what they love, uh, which we have heard time and again today is salmon. Um, uh, what that means uh, to the community um, in all the ways that you all outlined. Um, and then being able to draw in that community uh, with, with personal relationships um, um, about taking care of one another and about learning uh, from the landowners um, outside of this partnership. Um, I would encourage, uh, and I know that will continue um, as, as we move uh, forward. Uh, you know, I think that there was also, and I, and I think I'll close with, um, the recognizing that this is a journey, that this is, um, this is we're in it for the long haul. Um, there are good years and there are bad years, and there are years uh, um, where we will see better numbers uh, than other years, and we'll figure out what, why that is, um, how we can address that, uh, being able to prioritize uh, those projects, again, um, that we have seen the most successes from, um, but recognizing that our work here isn't done and that together we need to move forward um, uh, for year after year, um, uh, continuing that this, again, is, is a long journey. Um, but seeing, again, uh, the respect each of you have for one another, uh, the respect uh, about the partnership um, and uh, celebrating those successes. Uh, I, I just really uh, feel so fortunate um, to be able to be part of this conversation today to listen to everything uh, that you had to share. Um, and uh, again, uh, thank you uh, for um, uh, taking this opportunity away um, from your days um, and, and uh, making those sacrifices to come and share this. I, I really appreciate that, uh, and I sincerely thank you.